Well, Ian McFarlane, thank you for joining us for this conversation. You've had a remarkable career yourself as an economist, 28 years with the Reserve Bank and 10 years as chairman. Uh, that's a remarkable record. You're very highly regarded in that. But you've now turned your hand to something really interesting, not to imply that economics are not, uh, but uh, you've written a book about 10 remarkable Australians, most of whom most of us won't have heard of. And the subtitle is, They Made Their Mark on the World But Were Forgotten. Can I ask you at the outset, uh, what made you want to write about some remarkable people who'd been forgotten? I've always been a reader of history and biography, uh, mostly not Australian, but some Australian. And I found from time to time that I'd be reading a book, not about Australia, written by someone who's not Australian, and some really unusual and in interesting Australian will pop up. Now, the first occasion uh, that I noticed this was in 2003. So in a sense, the book goes back to 2003. I was reading a biography of Rupert Brooke, the uh, First World War poet. Yeah. And I came across a man called Frederick Septimus Kelly. And he was introduced in the book as a great sportsman. And he was. He'd um, won the Diamond Skulls at Henley three times. He'd won an Olympic gold medal. But it turns out, on closer inspection, that that was only the second string to his bow. He was first and foremost a classical music composer and concert pianist. He'd given solo concerts in different countries. He'd played with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. He'd played with the London Symphony Orchestra. I thought, what an amazing man. I ought to learn more about him. Most people have heard of the Hawker Aeroplane Company, probably the most famous name in military aviation in England, um, and it turns out uh, that this is the company that produced a Hawker Hurricane during the Second World War, which was the um, workhorse of the RAF during the Second World War. It also produced the first uh, vertical takeoff uh, jet, the Hawker Harrier. And it turns out that it's named after an Australian called Harry Hawker, uh, a young man of very humble origins, left school at the age of 14, a self-taught mechanic slash engineer who went to uh, who fell in love with the idea of flying he went to England at the age of 21 in 1912 got a job with the Sopwith aircraft company became their chief test pilot and this is the amazing bit really their number one designer their number one aeroplane designer um, there were a team of people who were designing these planes including the famous Sopwith Camel some uh, people may be aware of the shop with Camel, and uh, it was the plane that shot down the Red Baron, the Baron von Richthofen. You tell us why it was called the Camel. Yeah, I even tell you, explain that too. But the other the, that appealed to me, it was the plane that Biggles flew. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, at the end of the war, he then did something else that was quite amazing. He was the first person to attempt to fly across the Atlantic. Now, no one had attempted to fly a long distance across water before. and But he made the attempt, and the amazing thing is, he only got halfway, but he survived. And that is worth a book in itself, the story of Hawker's attempt to fly across the Atlantic. And it involves all sorts of other names, like King George V got involved, and Banjo Patterson even wrote a poem in his honor, because he thought Hawker was dead, but Hawker was still alive. Anyhow, look, this is the, this was the sort of process that was going on. And each time I came across someone like this, I thought, when I find the time, I'll write something about it. And um, eventually I put pen to paper in 2016. But the origin of the book goes way back beyond that. It goes back to uh, 2003. Um, so that's why I wrote it. Well, Ian, uh, it'd be fascinating in a minute. Let's dive into some of these personalities uh, and some of, even um, Hawker, just do a little more on what he did. But there's something that I'd like to ask you first. Why have we forgotten them? Is there something of a cultural cringe still in this country? Because what you're really telling here is the stories of some people who are not just being great Australians. They've made massive global yeah. contributions and we don't know about yeah. them. And in your own preface, you said something that was very interesting. You said as recently as last year, 
Film director Jeremy Sims is quoted in The Australian as saying, we were an inward-looking nation until the 1980s. Then there was everything from Greg Norman to Paul Keating, uh, Enix to uh, Kylie Minogue and Wayne Gardner. In fact, I think you argue, and I th believe passionately, assuming that is what you're arguing, that Australians were, have been very outward looking, yeah. very globally engaged and made an incredible contribution for a lot longer than the 1980s. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, I think part of the reason why we, we did, why we were so outward looking, was because we were small. Uh, if you're small, yep. you, you know that there's a big wide world out there. If you lived in London or New York, you tend to think everything that's important is available at home. But we, we knew that was not the case. Secondly, some of these people actually had to go abroad. I mean, you can't be a mountain climber and be successful if you just climb Australian mountains. And similarly, Hawker, uh, we didn't have an aeroplane industry, so it had to go to England. So there are a whole lot of reasons why we were always very outward looking. Now, that's the first answer to the first part of your question. The second part of your question is, why do we not know about these people? And um, I think one of the reasons is um, the nature of our publishing industry. Um, when I uh, wrote this book, I attempted to get it published by some of the big publishers. I went to three of the big publishers and they all said, no, no, you know, it's not commercially viable. People won't buy books about people I haven't heard of. Um, and that way of thinking seems to dominate the publishing industry. So what they do, they're a bit like Hollywood studios that keep making remakes of uh, old classics. They keep publishing the same stuff again and again. So I did a bit of quick research, just Googled through some pages and um, discovered that since 2000, there have been 12 biographies of Ned Kelly published and 10 of Captain Cook and 11 of Don Bradman. So the problem is they're not very adventurous. They keep publishing the same old stuff. Uh, and I think that's why these lesser known characters have been forgotten. I think in a bigger country with a much bigger publishing industry, I think some of these people might have might still be being remembered. Mind you, they were at one stage very well known. Yeah. Most of these people have biographies written of them, mostly out of print now. So they were actually recognised for a time. It's just really, I think, in the last 30 or 40 years that we've tended to forget them. Interesting that you should mention uh, reluctance on the part of big publishing houses to print books that we subsequently learn are very valuable, but things that are important. Uh, Henry Handel Richardson, who wasn't really Henry Handel Richardson, uh, is a very well-known Australian author who wrote a trilogy, you know, The Fortunes of Richard Marnie. Uh, and the first two parts were so disappointing and sold so poorly and had such bad reviews, the publisher didn't want to do the third one. Yeah. She had a wonderful husband yeah. who did a print run of a, a thousand, I think yeah, you 1, said. 000, yeah. And all of a sudden everybody recognised this remarkable person yeah. who, as yeah. I say, she wasn't really Henry anyway, was she? No, no, she was Ethel. Uh, but she was always called Etty. And she's the only, as far as I know, she's the only big name Australian woman writer who took a male pseudonym. All the others stuck with their, their, their original names. But yeah, that's another example of where publishers can sometimes get it wildly wrong. If I were to say to you of all of these, who were the, the one, the two or the three that if you could bring them back to life and to your table for a dinner time conversation, who would you choose? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think I'd probably go for George Morrison, who's better Morrison known. Morrison of Peking. Is, yeah, or Chinese Morrison or Morrison of Peking had both those nicknames. Mm -hmm he became the acknowledged expert on what was going on in China, particularly all the geopolitical machinations between the English, the French, the Germans, the Russians, the Japanese, all trying to find little bits of China that they could take. Um, and he became the man to consult if you wanted to know what was going on. So the president of America consulted him, the emperor of Japan consulted him and of course the president of China, and eventually became, uh, he left the Times and became private advisor to the emperor of China. And along the way, he got caught up in another adventure, which was the Boxer Rebellion. 
uh, when the boxers rose up and tried to drive out all the foreign devils uh, from Peking and all the foreign devils ended up in the British legation and they were seized by the boxers. Now, Morrison was in his element because he was personally a very brave man and a very good marksman. And so he was one of the, the virtually the deputy leader of the group who uh, were responsible for defending the legation. But in the process of which uh, the leader got killed, got shot, and Morrison got shot too. He got shot through the leg. So Morrison led a very, very interesting and eventful life. And I think anyone who's been both speared and shot has got a claim to having led a colourful and adventurous life. His understanding of China was obviously very deeply profound. And, and you, you talk in the book a bit about the hundred years of the century of resentment. Yeah. Uh, that really, I suppose, started with the opium, first opium war and then yeah. the second opium war, which wasn't really about opium. Yeah. It's cause for stopping and pausing and thinking a little bit, really, isn't it? I mean, the way the Western powers behaved in China has a great deal to do with some of the challenges we now face, I suspect, globally. Yeah. Um, the British were the first with the uh, first opium war, but they'd sort of behaved themselves, really, by the time... Morrison arrived on the scene. But the really big aggressors by then were the Russians, the Japanese and the Germans. Hmm. Um, and the Chinese just seemed utterly powerless because they had a, a hopeless, corrupt uh, dynasty, the Qing dynasty, hmm. um, and a completely hopeless army. Um, and they were just humiliated. In fact, they call that period the, the, the century of national humiliation. National humiliation. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why uh, later the Chinese could embrace someone like Mao Zedong because for all the terrible things he did, he always had this credit of being the man who drove the foreign devils out. And whether he actually did or not, uh, whether it was his side or, or the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek side that got rid of the Japanese or whether it was Americans that got rid of the Japanese, in the end Mao got mm. their reputation or built a reputation being the man who got rid of the, the foreigners. And so we're still living with the, uh, the result of that. And there was an Australian there who must have had an incredible set of insights into the dangers that we were really building up for ourselves. Yeah, he wasn't... Um, yeah... He, he, well, he understood he was ahead of his time. For example, at first, he realised the Russians were a real problem and so he put some faith in the Japanese. And then he quickly was first to turn and realise the Japanese were going to be the next big problem for China. And so that whilst the British were still, uh, British government was still looking upon Japan as an ally and a friend uh, and helpful in the region, uh, Morrison was saying, no, no, there's going to be real trouble there. Uh, Japan will be the, 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 the menace, and, and of course they turned out to be uh, and, and the, um, when they marched in and conquered uh, Manchuria, which they did twice. They did it once during uh, Morrison's time and once again in the 1930s. One of the things that comes through uh, with quite a few of the people that, uh, whose history you've written here is that it was a different era in that you've, you've mentioned, for example, uh, 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 Hawker. He had no formal engineering training, uh, and yet he became an incredibly respected designer. Yeah. Um, that was not quite so rare then. In a strange quirk of history, uh, he was instrumental in building Britain's best warplanes, but they were powered by another man who had no formal engineering training either, but built the engines that certainly won the Battle of Britain yeah. and played an enormous role in the Second World War. Henry Royce yeah. of Rolls-Royce. Yeah. He too had no formal training. Um, interesting that um, they plainly were, they had opportunities that perhaps you might not have today with that, that formal education. Yeah, I think um, the, you're right. You could, if you had the intuitive ability, uh, get ahead with that formal education. The other thing you could do in those days was you could be good at more than one thing. Uh, in fact, every one of these people was good at more than one thing. Some of them were good at three or four things. And the other thing you could do is at some stage in your life, you could sort of change direction and, and still excel at the second thing. 
I think today uh, life is much, much more competitive and people are much, much more specialised. Uh, but in those days, you could, uh, you could do two or three different things in your life at the one time or one after the other. Jeffrey Blaney in his foreword uh, says that um, uh, you're, uh, you, he likes your style very much uh, and that sometimes you're quite understated that you said of Gilbert Murray, for example, uh, that the worst that could be said of him is that he tended to make the mistake of thinking that everybody else was as reasonable as he was. Uh, now, Gilbert Murray, of course, uh, amongst other things, was one of the great thinkers behind the League of Nations. And I think there probably was an assumption there that if we created the right circumstances, yeah. everybody behaved reasonably and sensibly yeah. and stopped fighting wars. Didn't work, though. It didn't, it didn't even get look like working, actually. Uh, mm. I mean, right from the beginning, the Americans didn't join. I mean, even though Woodrow Wilson had really been the main architect of it, the uh, Congress uh, wouldn't support America joining. Um, uh, Germany wasn't in it originally, and then it was, uh, it was invited in, and then as soon as Hitler came to power, they walked out. Italy walked out, Japan walked out. Uh, it, was, it really never had much of a hope. And the idea of disarmament, multilateral disarmament, uh, well, we know what happened. One country was arming as fast as it could, which is Germany, and the others were talking about the word disarmament. Mm. Um, but one thing I, I, I do want to mention about this book is um, I didn't write it because I had a particular view on history that this has to be done. I didn't write it because I wanted to build a monument to these people. If that happens, that's good. But I wrote it simply because I found the story so interesting. Mm. And I was confident that there would be people out there who would find it interesting. And in fact, the original title of the book was Interesting Lives. But I was persuaded that that was a bit weak. I would have something a bit more positive. Uh, anyhow, it's, it's done well. It's, uh, it's now gone into its second printing. So there must be a lot of people who, uh, who are enjoying it, um, even though it hasn't had the support of a big publisher with their big... Uh, distribution and marketing arms behind them. So I'm re really happy with the way it's gone. Well, I, I'm pleased to hear that. The, um, uh, I think history is important, uh, that the further you can see back into the past, the further into the future you might be able to see. Uh, you're an economist. Uh, uh, I think uh, economists tend to think that history is important because you don't want to repeat the mistakes that have been made in the past. For example, uh, we've had uh, the Banking Royal Commission of Inquiry in Australia. Uh, it's tempting to say we ought to rewrite all of the rules. Well, people have been writing prudential rules for the financial sector for centuries. Some have worked, some haven't. Mm. You want to make sure you understand them. Uh, military people study the history of battles to avoid making previous mistakes, learn the valuable lessons of what wins, what, what doesn't. Um, the, you know, the remarkable Australian historian, again, quoting him, Geoffrey Blaney, who wrote... Uh, a foreword for you. He, uh, he makes the point that maybe we've made history too boring and that interesting biographies, you yourself have said this was very interesting, interesting biographies might be a great way yeah. to whet people's appetite again yeah, for a yeah. discipline that we once thought of as very important. Yeah, uh, Geoffrey says uh, in the introduction, the book makes me think that in an era when Australian history implants boredom in many senior students, Biography may be the one way of recapturing their interest. And I think that's, I think that's true. Well, certainly I wouldn't dispute Geoffrey Blaney's views on history anyhow, but I think that's right because um, uh, Australian, the interpretation of Australian history have gone through uh, a big change. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's an a pos positive approach to the development of Australia or there's the negative approach. Um, and it may be at one time where there was too much positive, uh, but I think at the moment the, the pendulum swung too far the other way. And I think um, the risk is, and apparently uh, this is what is happening, is that students, uh, as Geoffrey says, senior students are losing interest in it because the way it's presented is so gloomy uh, and boring. Um, and one way of um, making it interesting 
is, is actually to read biography because biographies are always interesting because you start, you know, you get someone's life. You start through their childhood and their young adulthood, marriage, their career. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing story. And in the process of learning about that person, you learn a lot more. You learn all about their times. You learn about their contemporaries. You learn about the places they went to and the events that occurred during that time. So reading historical biography is, even if you're not specifically trying to improve your knowledge of history, it will improve. Some of them led, uh, I must say, uh, some extraordinarily interesting lives, and it, you powerfully remind us of just how human we are. Surprising the number of people, uh, men who were interested in boxing, yeah. Surprising the number numbers who dabbled in spiritualism. Yeah. Some of it pretty weird stuff, frankly. Yeah, that surprised me. There were about three of those uh, of the ten had a very strong interest in spiritualism. Mm. Um, and the the other thing is that uh, boxing was almost an upper class pastime. Then. Yeah, uh, you know, a gentleman, uh, a, a, a English gentleman with a private income, like J. W. H. T. Douglas could take up boxing. Uh, Russell, the painter, when he was in Paris, one of the first things he did was set up a boxing club. Uh, Gilbert Murray's brother, Sir Hubert Murray, who was the, really almost the founder of Australia's involvement in Papua New Guinea, was a very good boxer. So the times were different then, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, interesting ways. To come to your own perspectives, you've had a long and very distinguished public career. You love this country. You've made an enormous contribution to it. You've written about people who have made a great contribution. To come to something that, that you yourself have uh, just commented on, we seem to have adopted a pretty dark view of our own past and with it, almost a self-loathing of our own culture. We seem to feel that you know we're, we're very obsessed with the things we've done that have been inappropriate. Uh, we, we, we lack heroes. Uh, some of the people we do talk about as heroes are not particularly heroic in my view. How do you feel about the future for Australia? Are you an optimist? A realist yeah, just, or pessimist? Well, I think I am an optimist because I think the pendulum will swing again at some point or swing towards the middle where you've we, we can applaud the achievements as well as admit that there were shortcomings along the way. Uh, I think the, the pendulum will swing back there. And the other thing is, I think the general public, as opposed to the professional historians, I think the general public, uh, in their book buying and their film going, still have a taste for orthodox narrative history that we both grew up with. So I think the public has still got a demand for that. And... Um, so I, I am an optimist, uh, but in the longer run. Well, plainly in the end, good economic management, which you've been involved in, and I've certainly been interested in for a long time, is not about a sweet set of numbers so much as better outcomes for people. That's what good economics ought to be about. Now, way back in the mid-90s, I understand that you warned that baby boomers were doing very well, whether it was out of investment properties and what have you. Uh, but that, and I think this is a direct quote, you're making yourselves richer at the expense of your children. And I think there's a great focus on that now as younger people look at flatlining wages, rising cost of assets, quantitative easing and so forth, perhaps has had that inflationary impact on assets. This question of intergenerational equity seems to be at the heart of harmony between the generations. Yeah, I think it is a big issue and I think it can really be summarised in um, in two variables that wages go up slowly, and um, for about three or four de decades, house prices have gone up much faster. Yeah. So the, re the the relative price of housing has become extremely high. Uh, now, I was giving a talk, I think it was in Adelaide in 1995, and someone was in the audience. I think said, "This can't be much of an expansion." we're in because house prices are still flat. And so I got onto one of my hobby horses, which was that rapidly rising house prices actually doesn't do anyone any good. Even the owner of the house, the benefit they get is minimal. So they're probably going to live in it. It's the same house. They want to stay in it until they get taken out in a box. The benefit to them is minimal. But the cost to the next generation who are trying to get into the housing market is very severe. Uh, 
and uh, I finished up my uh, explanation with that statement that what was happening is that people were making themselves richer at the expense of their children. Now that was in 1995. Since then, we've had two or another two housing price booms, and you know I can see the resentment in the mm. younger generations, uh, and they it, it 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 makes them question the inte whole integrity of the system. Yeah, uh, and it makes them. Uh, different to us in the sense that we always, I think, assumed we'd be better off than our parents. Yes. And I think that assumption no longer holds. And so it is, a, it, it is definitely an important issue, uh, but it's not an easy one to solve because uh, part of the reason are things that it's very difficult to address with a change in economic policy. For a start, the number one reason is I think that in any major city in the world where there are a lot of good high paying jobs, there is a problem rising house prices. If you're in London or New York or San Francisco or Hong Kong or Singapore, you'll definitely be seeing that. Closer to home, if you're in Toronto, Vancouver or Auckland or Sydney or Melbourne, it's simply because people want those jobs, they compete to buy property in desirable locations in those big cities. And it's actually, I think, been a bigger problem for us than other countries because we were always a very urbanised country. Now, the definition of urbanisation is what proportion of the country's population live in either the top two cities or the top three cities or top four cities, whichever way you do it. Australia is extremely heavily urbanised and always has been. Even in 1900, we were the most mm. urbanised country in the, uh, in the world. Um, so that has been something that's very hard to fight against. And the second thing, which was very influential during my period, was that when we finally got inflation down, which was a huge benefit to the country, uh, one of the benefits was that interest rates came down. And so interest rates effectively halved. And what that meant was, in essence, people could borrow twice as much as formerly yeah. they had for the same servicing cost. And so they used this extra uh, borrowing power to drive up house prices. And that was a sort of a one-off shift. Now that can't happen again, but it was a very big effect and it, it, would, it didn't happen quickly, it happened over a period of 10 or 15 years. So if you look at those two factors, you can sort of explain most of the reason why house prices are so high. But we also did things that made it more difficult for ourselves. Uh, and for example, I think we had the world's most permissive regime of negative gearing for household uh, investment purposes, more so than our other countries. Uh, and people would say we had planning restrictions that also caused problems. So there were things that we did to make it worse for ourselves. But overall, I think it was, it could not have been prevented. Uh, the raw numbers are, really, you know, if you'd sort of put it in layman's language, as I understand it, in the mid 70s, an average house in Australia costs something like four to five times annual average wages. It's now more like 12 times or even more in Sydney and yeah. Melbourne. Yeah, no, the, the, it is amazing how, how just how, uh, how much more expensive it is. And I'm very pleased that I'm not starting out now trying to buy a house in Sydney or Melbourne. I was always, con on, always conscious of this. That's why I was, gave that speech in 1995. Um, now, the good news is I don't think it can go on. I don't think that rate of increase that we've had over that three or four decades can continue because one of the ways it continued was because people were able to borrow more and more against their income. Now, they're, they're, they've reached the limit. That can't go up anymore. <clears throat> um, so I think other things being equal, the house prices rises will not be as strong as they were in the past. But it's, it's hard to believe they're ever going to go down again. It's very hard to see how they could go down. The best we could really hope for is that they go up 
at a very modest rate and that wages go up a bit faster. Um, I think that's the best we can hope for. And I think there's a reasonable chance that that will pan out that way. Um, now, one of the people you had a conversation with a couple of weeks ago was Andrew Stone, who's written a very good book that's interesting in his book, the first chapter is on house prices. Mm. And it's a, it's a very thorough piece of work. It's almost a book, it's about a hundred page chapter. And it's interesting that he's from a younger generation than us, that he hones in on that as virtually the first issue that he wants to take up. He, um, he thinks that population growth is a very big part of it, particularly recent population growth. And he thinks that um, foreign investment in housing is another big part of it. Uh, and he th is inclined to think that if that was, if both of those were tightened up, that would take a lot of the steam out of it. Um, and there are other things that could be done. There are things we're planning. I still myself think we were far too lenient on negative gearing. I think, for example, other countries, a number of other countries, say you could only subtract the loss on your housing investment from other investment income. But we say you can, you can subtract it from your wage and salary income. So that's a very lenient way we've done it. We, we have no restrictions on how highly you can gear. You can gear 100 to 1 and mm. still do it. Whereas a lot of areas of uh, business, the tax office wouldn't permit that. Mm. They have a, a thin capitalisation rules to prevent you doing excessive gearing. So I think there are things that can be done. And I think the situation will be better or sorry, it will, it will cease getting worse. But I don't think it's ever, ever going to unwind that great big lift in house prices that occurred over the course of two or, th or three decades, four decades, really. Yeah, well, it would certainly be of a concern if it continues to erode the confidence of young Australians in both democracy and capitalism, yeah. because I do think those are real dangers. And I'm not being glib about it because I can understand why they would feel disillusioned. The great warning I would make, I think, though, is be careful what you wish for. You've seen in America and in Britain a tendency for a lot of young people faced with high housing costs, flatlining wages, disappearing jobs, or at least the perception that a whole lot of jobs are going to disappear, um, uh, and uh, high student debts. You've seen a lot of young people, I think, looking in precisely the wrong place for the answers. Uh, you know, Populist solutions mm. put up by left-wing purporters to be tomorrow's leaders? Yeah, well, I think you're right, that is happening. And that's not going to be very helpful at all. That'll just make the situation make worse. worse. Um, it's interesting how, what a short time horizon some people have. I've had occasions where I've talked to people and they've said, oh, it used to be better in the good old days. And they say, 50s, 60s and the 70s. And I say, hey, hang on. Do you know anything about the 70s? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the 70s was our most disastrous decade. Yes. But the people aren't even aware of that. A lot of young people aren't even aware of that. And that was, if you measure, your, that was the first decade where we managed to have both high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. Stagflation. Yeah, stagflation. Um, no, that it would, but I, I think, I think that is a risk. I think that the uh, disenchantment with the system, I think, uh, the feeling that it used to be okay, it got better every generation until my generation, and now it's getting worse. Uh, and I, I think the biggest single, in my view, the biggest single contributor to that is the huge increase in uh, house prices. Mm. Well, I, it's hard to argue with that. Uh, at about the time that you gave that speech in 1995, there was a change of government in Canberra and uh, John Howard became Prime Minister. On the very day we were sworn in, I remember him saying, we need to do something about our budgetary situation. We need to end the emerging intergenerational theft. That's what he said. And the reason I uh, mention that is that we were resolved, uh, quite determined to wind back the deficits, move the country into surplus and try and pay down the debt. We ultimately succeeded in that. Um, it does worry me though that globally, particularly in the West, 
a very near economic miss uh, in 07, 08, 09, a debt crisis was basically resolved with mountains more debt, truly stupendous levels of debt in many Western countries, including America. And that one of the most important things that governments have to do in this country is to try and make sure that we're in the best possible place if another collapse is triggered, because this time it could be a lot more serious than the last one. Those countries are very limited in their options to rebuild their economies if it goes wrong again. Yeah, well, I'm actually becoming quite humble in my uh, assessment of my ability to understand how economies perform. Um, I never thought I would live to see the day where the major central banks of the world, their main aim was to get inflation up. Mm -hmm. I never thought I would live to see the day where the public was so keen to lend money to governments and would lend money at negligible or even negative rates. Uh, I never thought I would see the day where the biggest concentrations of corporate economic power were in companies that didn't charge the customers anything and therefore were completely outside the net of antitrust. Now, the world is a very difficult place to fathom. Um, so I'm sort of a bit hesitant to lay down the law. Uh, I, definitely, I definitely agree with you, I think, in, in the sense that I thought the uh, budget consolidation during that period was uh, very, very helpful and put us in a strong position. I'm not as pessimistic as you are now. I, I, I think that um, the debt to GDP ratio in Australia is, is very low by world standards and, and, and uh, manageable. Um, I, uh, I think we're in reasonable shape to handle a contractionary shock but we're not going to be able to do it with monetary policy mm. because I think uh, that monetary policy has uh, has run its course. It, it is expansionary. It's at maximum expansionary. Uh, but I don't think there is any room left to make it more expansionary. I think that's partly my point. Yeah. And I, look, I don't want to sound overly pessimistic about Australia's shape. Mm. I think we're in basically sound shape. I think my point, though, is the one that you make... Uh, there'll be very uh, limited options with lower interest rates or even you know, higher levels of credit if things go wrong globally again for us. And there will be a heavier reliance on government being able to step up. We can probably do it. Other yeah. countries can't. The message for Australia, though, I think is let's not get onto that slippery slope that so many other countries found themselves on last time. Yeah, well, um, when I uh, first started uh, studying economics, uh, not studying economics, practicing economics in the 70s, Australia was regarded as almost a juvenile delinquent of the world because we had these big budget deficits and we had this massive inflation and we had this huge real wage increase. But particularly on fiscal policy, we were regarded as incorrigible. But I have to say, looking over the last 30 years or 40 years, we've actually done a pretty good job, a very good job by world standards, by having periods of budget surplus and periods of budget deficit and having, uh, by world standards, a very low ratio of government debt to GDP. We might differ on this one, John, but that's, I think we're down, uh, uh, I think overall over that long period, we, we should take some satisfaction from our No, I, I, I don't differ. I think, yeah. I, or I think the point that I just want to make is that we won't be able to control events, so we need to be in a stronger position as we can be for what I think is the very high likelihood of a serious problem somewhere globally triggering a another round, if you like, of the GFC. It's just my point being that we need to be as well prepared yeah. to withstand the shock as oh, possible. Oh, yeah, you do. I agree with that. In fact, one of the um, changes that I, in economics has occurred over my lifetime is when I first started, we had this huge confidence that we were going to be good forecasters. And we spent a huge amount of money building econometric models. And uh, uh, this is in the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, the Reserve Bank, Treasury spent huge amounts of money doing this. Uh, we're much more humble about our capacity to forecast. Uh, and the idea that you can forecast an event and preempt it with policy, we've virtually given up on that. And instead, the, the, the correct approach 
is to, to look at the economy and ask how resilient will it be if a shock occurs? Mm. Uh, how many bits of it can bend but not break? And I think we've moved in that direction, and I think it is the only direction you can move. Um, and uh, well, the first the first example of bending but not breaking was to move to a floating exchange rate, which, by the way, we were one of the last countries in the world to do. Uh, and uh, the other the other thing too, which people seem to forget, is actually in the global financial crisis, one of the reasons we got through so well was we had strong banks. Yes, the banks are on the nose at the moment, but. Uh, 11 years ago, they weren't. People were very pleased that we had strong banks. Only Australia and Canada were the only two countries where the government didn't have to appeal to the taxpayers to bail out their banks. And so that's another example of, uh, of something you do to make the economy res resilient, have a very strong banking system. Well, Ian, uh, you've written a book which has brought a lot of history back to the table. And thank you for that. And I thoroughly recommend it. I'm holding it up. Good. Thank you very buy, much. Buy a heap of copies and give them away for Christmas and birthday presents because uh, nothing like giving people good, yes. uh, good brain food. But the other thing I would say is thank you for drawing on your own observations over many years. We're not good in this country in capturing the wisdom of the past. So here's a book to help, but I can only encourage you wherever you get the opportunity to, to speak, to write, to, to talk as we've done today, to impart the experience and the insights from a long and very distinguished career as an economist in this country. Well, thank look, you. thank you very much for inviting me, John. And I very, uh, I admire very much what you're doing with your uh, blogging. I f first became aware of it when you wrote an article in the Australian, I think, called Why I Blog. <laughs> and uh, so keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.